Well, greetings everyone from here in London and many thanks indeed to Associate Professor Tamsin Peach for the invitation to speak with you today and also to Dr Michael Falk for all of his assistance with the various technical and administrative aspects behind this session. And so to business. In a January edition, there we go, of London's Evening Standard newspaper, young Joe Bromley had a confession to make. Beneath the headline, I used chat GPT to research my dissertation, here's why it's fine, Joe detailed and justified his recent interface with the most prominent of the new AI language bots to help him with his thesis on fashion journalism. While keen to point out that he had not used chat GPT to compose any raw text, Joe did note that the bot provided a much more efficient tool than Google or Wikipedia for the purposes of drawing up items for a literature review. Call me lazy, he stated, but it helped me produce an initial list of books and academics for my research. I still read the damn text, but that short conversation with ChatGPT saved me hours of trawling through Wikipedia. Now, Joe is not so different from those among my undergraduates or the school age offspring of my colleagues using ChatGPT to assist with their history essays. Why not save time and energy, they reason, by dipping into the collective mind of AI to help them uh, have at best a steer, or for us as educators, at worst a lead author. Memory for these students mostly equates to data, hence prompting the synapses of the bot seems akin to learning from an omniscient master historian. As critics have been quick to point out, chat GPT has its evident shortcomings. Written text can be formulaic, albeit eminently passable and even sometimes commendable. The data set stops at 2021 and perhaps most concerningly, chat GPT falls foul of the same issues pertaining to earlier aggregated data sets, namely a skew towards particular national knowledge economies especially those in the West, as illustrated by this somewhat grainy slide. The last of these issues will doubtless be familiar to the Wikipedia experts among us today, just as also held true in a still more refined way for those used to reading hard copy encyclopedias in an era before the internet. So in this short lecture, I want to move somewhat away from the world of bits and bots to offer instead a longer perspective on the concept of collective memory, a term that needs some unpacking. I will go on to chart the interface between historians and the field of memory studies, and to explore a contemporary and real world example of collective memory in action here in London. Looking beyond and before the digital realm as the default domain for comprehending the construction of social meaning, I shall instead examine how group understandings of the past have long been advanced and edited by historians. From this, a conceptual apparatus has emerged for tackling the ruptures and harmonies entailed by reflecting collectively. Moving between the analog and digital worlds, I shall aim to lay the ground for further discussion on how collective memory can best be understood. So when we use the word memory today, we are likely to be referring not to an art or to a practice as was the norm in the early modern period, but instead, as mentioned already, to storage capacity. The world of terabytes and server farms is the world many people might think of upon hearing the word, the word memory. Sometimes they also might think perhaps of mental capacity. But memory has a deeper history, one which, one which historians have excavated and explored, and from which some vital through lines can be traced. Its modern roots lie in the late 19th century. We might turn here to the 1890s writings of French philosopher Henri Bergson, for instance, a scholar who sought to differentiate between unconscious forms of memory, so-called motor mechanisms, and its conscious forms, 
deliberative recollections of a moment in the past. Such interest in the experience of memory in the present strongly influenced both literary and psychological approaches to the topic in the 20th century. The novelist Marcel Proust, in his celebrated multi-volume novel In Search of Lost Time, explored the ways in which memories could be involuntarily and powerfully prompted. For example, and most famously, when his narrator tastes a piece of madeleine cake he has dipped in his tea and feels a wave of, I quote, delicious pleasure, which he only much later realises was because the taste reminded him of Sunday morning childhoods with his aunt when he enjoyed such refreshments. The psychoanalytic theories of Sigmund Freud centred on the cyclic handling of such memories. Memories uh, that for Freud were often traumatic, those are the ones that, that most interest him. And those traumatic memories, he argued, were repressed in the unconscious mind and needed to somehow be coaxed back into consciousness to decode and dissolve their painful meanings. These pioneering scholars of memory were concerned principally with individuals and their concerted or unconscious reflections. Not until the second quarter of the 20th century did attention focus on collective memory. And this in turn is associated above all with the French sociologist Maurice Aubwax. A student of Bergson, who was also influenced by French sociologist Emile Durkheim, Aubwax's central insight was that all individual remembering always takes place in a social context using the linguistic and symbolic resources of that environment. Even when we remember alone, he argued, almost a century ago now, we can only communicate our memories using language, language that is inherently social in nature. In this schema, human inner life was socially determined and contextual understanding was hence crucial. His most famous study of the inscription of collective memory in the urban landscape focused on the city of Jerusalem, a setting where the historical perspectives of successive waves of inhabitants and invaders were inscribed into the local topography. Each of these waves sponsored a different collective memory. For all blacks, there are as many different collective memories as groups within society. It is individuals within those groups who spur the reflections, but in so doing, they draw on context, hence making collective memories socially constructed. Moreover, all collective memories are influenced by the present as well as by the past, and so generational factor, factors and the punctuation of successive historical events accordingly have a strong influence. Shaped by all blacks, the final two decades of the 20th century witnessed a memory boom, as scholars across a range of disciplines discovered the subject and those with exclusively English language skills picked up Albrecht's newly translated text. Many publications on collective memory uh, hence followed. A generation after the end of the Second World War, there was, by the 1980s, a readiness to confront the horrors of that conflict including and perhaps especially the Holocaust. After 1989, further impetus was added when the collapse of communist regimes brought to the fore numerous tensions and strands of memory that had been frozen, taboo or otherwise inaccessible for decades. In the West, dominant assumptions about whose histories should be taught and commemorated were by now being questioned, related in part to activism and also to postmodernism which posed a philosophical challenge to the authority of traditional history. Changing technology too played a role. As Jay Winter uh, notes, advances in digital data storage and transmission with the advent of the personal com computer and email allowed witnessing to expand both in reach and in range of content. By this time, it was well established following Alessandro Portelli's work on oral history, that memory was best approached, and I quote, not as a passive depository of facts, but as an active process of creation of meanings. 
It works differently at different points in the life cycle, Alistair Thompson adds. And from neurobiology, we know that memories are distributed across the brain, engaging multiple portions of grey matter, each of which deals with different aspects and tasks of remembering. The turn to memory was accompanied by a turn towards place as an object of study, something that Hallbrax had anticipated. And in this regard, the huge French collaborative project led by Pierre Nora uh, on lieu de mémoire, or sites of memory, was extremely influential. Nora's work elucidated the distinction he drew between real community memory milieu de mémoire, which he believed had died out in France around the 1970s, and the didactic expression of national memory through lieu or sites of memory. For Nora, these were vestigial crystallizations of memory in time and place. And aside from statues, which were an obvious uh, source of interest, objects like books could also fit in within this delineation of sites of memory a framework that could also readily be stretched to incorporate more recent innovations like Wikipedia. By now, the field of memory studies had been born with journals, professional societies, conferences and an avalanche of publications soon following. Drawing heavily from philosophy and from literary, cultural and psychoanalytic theory, as well as from sociology, anthropology, geography and other disciplines, this is a capacious arena indeed. There is now an immense supporting literature, as well as several useful books that offer a broad survey for the commencing pilgrim. A thriving subfield of cultural memory has emerged, devoted to exploring the ways in which cultural heritage is recorded, transmitted, enacted and lodged in human consciousness. Elida Asman is worth consulting here uh, she developed this focus on transmission, drawing a useful and influential distinction between those aspects of the past that we actively remember, such as by choosing to display them in a museum, the so-called canon of cultural memory, as she puts it, and those forgotten but not lost traces of the past, which we store for possible access in the future, the so-called archive. Now, memory's twin inescapably is forgetting. And this, scholars have argued, could be collective too. Paul Ricoeur, who contrasts in particular the dangers of what he calls escapist forgetting, such as the tendency by the victors of history to forget the history of its victims, with the value of active forgetting in the context of forgiveness. Such forgiveness should not erase the traces and records of the past, he argues. And one wouldn't need to think too long to ponder examples of both types of collective forgetting. Contrasting the treatment accorded episodes such as the Armenian genocide by the descendants of its perpetrators with the efforts of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission to bear witness and then to move on from the horrors of apartheid. A psychological emphasis also remains within the field of memory studies, stretching back to Freud. Hence, Marianne Hirsch's influential concept of post-memory was conceived to capture the sense of many children of, Hol of Holocaust survivors that their lives had been haunted by complex inherited memories that they only partially understood. It has though, this concept of post-memory that is, been widely applied in other contexts to explore the transmission of the past, and particularly of traumatic or concealed pasts to subsequent generations. On the other hand, the fast developing sciences of memory may soon lead us into a new era in which pharmacological treatments will be available to enable so-called therapeutic forgetting. Concurrently, within memory studies as a whole, a great deal of literature and conference attention remains focused on themes of trauma, perhaps not a surprising outcome of working through the horrors of the 20th and early 21st centuries, but a focus which nonetheless often misses memories sponsored by more consensual practices, 
many of them collective and all of them also relational. More recently, again, scholars across multiple fields are now engaged in understanding how the digital realm shapes individual and collective memory. From the nostalgic reminiscences uh, hosted uh, on sites uh, engaging with an urban past, uh, his, his lost Melbourne, for example, which shares photographs of uh, the city as it used to be. Um, so, so there's that domain to the digital renderings of past worlds explored by gamers through their consoles. Through these worlds and these engagements, scholars have been hard at work to track meanings, sometimes drawing on Marita Sturken's notion that so-called technologies of memory are increasingly influential in mediating memory through an array of channels. And this conference is pioneering, I think, in its attempts to unpick how Wikipedia interfaces and fuses with knowledge of the past as part of all of this. And you won't be surprised to hear me champion the vital place within this of historians as trained specialists in the interpretation of the past, in guiding and enriching these interpretive processes. And here I think public historian Alex Green's attention on the historian's toolkit is useful. That toolkit contains practice skills in analyzing social relations, understandings of patternings of time, the ability to weave and map context, and to evaluate and integrate evidence, and also to persuade audiences. All of this can also prove extremely valuable here. So we need then a rich understanding of the long vectors of memory in shaping the domains of public engagement, and also of the real world public landscapes in which memory so often uh, unfolds. And it is to an applied example of this that I now turn in order to round out my analysis. As the scholar Edward Casey contends and Olbwax concurs, memory is inherently spatial. We must therefore ground our understanding of memory in both the textured 3D world of experience, which we inhabit day to day, and in the digital world with which it is ever increasingly imbricated. As an illustration of this, uh, let me turn now to the COVID memorial wall alongside the Thames here in London. This unofficial memorial is composed of tens of thousands of individual hearts bearing the names of loved ones lost to the disease. Cited opposite the Houses of Parliament since March 2021 as a reminder to politicians blamed by many surviving family members for policies that exacerbated the severity of the pandemic, the wall serves as an effective reminder of both the individual tragedy of lost loves and the collective scale of death. And in the absence of a state sanctioned official memorial, the COVID war memorial fills a kind of bottom up need, offering families a chance to gather and to ritualize the loss and to see their pain honored in public. What we might call memorial accessorizing and seen here features through the addition of printed photos and personal messages around the sign as seen in the top left image. And pausing to ponder individual hearts can prove an affecting experience, such as in this instance on the lower left, uh, with the example of Maureen Morton, Nana, photographed and identified as a fan of Liverpool Football Club. You'll never walk alone. This then is a people's memorial falling outside and indeed in some ways and in several ways antithetical to state power. And the memorial lives in multiple spaces. It physically adorns the walls flanking the Thames where loved ones come to mark in ink the names of the lost on painted red hearts and to view names already written by kith and kin. Politicians and the general public also frequent this space and the, and the memorial is visually striking even from a distance, a crimson ribbon some half a kilometre in length. A small army of volunteers also tends the memorial 
re-inscribing names and repainting red hearts. The memorial lives digitally as well. And here, for example, is a screenshot of the Wikipedia entry uh, for the site, which has been recently added to, as of course is one of the, the benefits of the format. And here, interestingly, is uh, a di is a screenshot of the digitized version of this space uh, to, to sponsor further forms of collective memory. And using the link on screen, nationalcovidmemorialwall.org, you can scroll the entire length of the memorial and at various intervals, listen to oral history testimonies of loved ones reflecting on loss and what the memorial means to them. And the digital version of the COVID memorial wall speaks to that loss. It also speaks to presence and to potential future erasure. For this, we must be reminded, is an unofficial or in memory studies terms, a vernacular memorial. National in ambition, but not in terms of permission. So far, Westminster Council have not brought pressure washers to what could uncharitably be viewed as graffiti, but the memorial is vulnerable to such defacement as well as to fading over time. The idea of collective memories as palimpsestic or layered is also underscored by the presence within the COVID memorial wall of an older memorial plaque. Uh, this to recall those lost to the neurodegenerative disorder Kreutzfeld Jakob disease, so called mad cow disease, in the 1980s. And we remember here Holbach's contention that our concern to remember collectively is forever informed by presentist concerns. Collective remembering, whether in the physical landscape or in a virtual domain, is always also tied to power. The COVID memorial wall, and to an extent Wikipedia, may be examples exhibiting more democratic potential than is often the norm, but we must remember that the past is most often used to naturalise and to justify the existing social order. It has also played a very important role in providing inspiration, identity and focus to movements challenging that status quo in the name of women, the poor and religious, ethnic or sexual minorities, among others. In today's fragmented and fast changing digital and media landscape, the presence of the past and its use and contestation is more dispersed and diverse than ever. Trained historians with questioning mindsets must therefore be agile in surveying and understanding this ever-changing scene. For the importance of historical expertise and sophisticated analytical skills in our public debate about the past seems, if anything, to be greater than ever. So thanks then for your attention today. Feel very free to find me via the usual channels and here in closing is a quick plug for my co-edited textbook for teaching undergraduate and graduate students, History, Memory and Public Life. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and thanks again. All the best.